Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm Grace Chen, the director of the Sculpture Center, and we're going to go ahead and start, I think. Um, I want to welcome you to this evening's happy hour with artists from the Sculpture Center's exhibi exhibition, The Shape of Sculpture, Recent Cranbook Graduates. Um, I am very happy to see you all here tonight. I want to tell you, if you haven't come to the Sculpture Center and seen the exhibition, please know we are free and open to the public Wednesday through Fridays from 12 to 4 p.m. and Saturdays from 12 to 5 p.m. The show will run through Saturday, November 7. So tonight we're going to talk with three artists in the exhibition who work in textile, film, and digital media. As you know, this medium of the sculpture is ever expanding. And though the artists come from the sculpture department of the Cranbrook Academy of Art, their work extends the boundaries of how sculpture is defined. I'll tell you a little about them, and then they will give more information about themselves and their work. These artists will also talk about their career paths and where they might be headed. And they'll also share how the pandemic has affected their working process. Um, just a little housekeeping before we start. I want you to know we are recording this talk for future use. Um, after the artist talk, we'll have a little time for Q&A. So please hold your questions until then. Okay, so let me begin introducing our artists. Um, Artist Malika Abikinari. Malika, do you want to just give a little wave? Um, she is going to graduate this spring from the Cranbrook Academy. Uh, Malika grew up in Iran. Her work explores the systems of repression that she endured as a child and adult in both the home and by the state, including police, schools, and various other actors and institutions. Her work, both practical and theoretical, is the nature and function of memory how it is constructed and reconstructed. The work of Luke Warren, hi Luke. Um, he is the class of 2020. He deal, his work deals with harmful ideologies and mythologies surrounding portrayals of gender in film. His piece in the exhibition, Dirty Harry, 1971, is part of a photographic series that pulls from his background in film studies in investigating toxic masculinity in iconic protagonists from cinema. 
artist Tiffany Danielle Elliott, class of 2019, is interested in human connections and disconnections with one another and within the relationship of body to object and body as object. She is fascinated by our intense desires and requirements to document ourselves. Her work in the exhibition, The Digital Companion, explores what happens when we begin to understand ourselves and others as digital, physical, and immaterial objects. So tonight, our talk is moderated by artist and educator, Jimmy Keenly. Hi, Jimmy. Jimmy works in various media and has exhibited his projects nationally and internationally. His recent work features site-specific inflatable institutions in museums, as well as public performance treks through rural, rural and urban cities in the US, such as Chicago, Detroit, Austin, St. Louis, Cincinnati, San Antonio, Dallas, and New York, as well as international performances in Japan, Italy, and Finland. Jimmy is an associate professor of foundation at the Cleveland Institute of Art, and he serves on the board of the Sculpture Center. So Jimmy, I'm gonna let you start and take it away. Uh, hi everyone, how you doing? Hope you're doing well. Uh, oh. Can you not hear me? I don't think we can hear you, Jimmy. Oh, just a second. I can hear you. I don't know if other people can, but I yeah, can. Yeah, I can hear you too. You can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Apparently people can hear me. Is that all right? Let's okay, see, so we're gonna <laughs> hold on while Jimmy. Well, uh, here I, we're gonna do do on. Uh, I'm, his, I'm gonna. Um, can you not hear me? Working. Oh, you can. You can hear. Him. Yeah. I think we... everyone can hear me, but Grace, is that true? Whoa. Yeah. We. Oh, we can't. No. Some people can hear me. Hey. Well, this is COVID time, and uh, it's nice to meet you, Malika, uh, Luke, and Tiffany. Uh, and, and so since it's COVID time and you don't meet people face to face, my introduction to COVID time that you'll see momentarily uh, is, is funny now that I've met you, Luke. So um, here we go. What does it mean to be an artist in the time of COVID? We are going to ask recent Cranbrook Academy of Art graduates, Malika Abakanari, Tiffany Daniel Elliott, and Luke Warren, whose work is currently on display at the Sculpture Center. We are all here together in the middle of a pandemic. So let's get to the questions and meet the artists. Computers sure are weird. Whoa. What does it mean to be an artist in the time of COVID? We are going to ask recent Cranbrook Academy of Art graduates, Malika Abakanari, Tiffany Daniel Elliott, and Luke Warren, whose work is currently on display at the Sculpture Center. We are all here together in the middle of a pandemic, so let's get to the questions and meet the artists. Computers sure are weird. Whoa. So hopefully the audio came through on that because uh, I can't hear it on my end. But uh, yes, the, the Corona apocalypse is strange. Computers are weird. We interface with everyone in uh, in these virtual virtual worlds. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what the artists have to say. So I'm going to turn it over to them to let uh, the three of you introduce yourself and uh, your work to us. Let's start with Malika. Um, hi everyone and thanks for being here. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist. I was born and raised in Iran and I moved to the United States eight years ago. And I currently live and work in Los Angeles and Detroit. Um, my work explores the enduring and um, evolving nature and function of experience and memory. Many of my formative experiences um, and memories in Iran are tied to US military and foreign policy, economic sanctions, insistent fears of military strikes, psychological warfare, um, and the use of so-called soft power have marked Iranian society for decades. Um, in the works I create, it is not my primary intent to directly portray the issues I'm dealing with, um, but to find ways to merge my concerns um, within motifs and language that are inspired by Iran's textiles, architecture, and literature. 
And my practice involves a wide area of mediums, including installation, video, performance, research, documentation, and drawing. Should I jump? I can jump in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead, Luke. <laughs> all right, all right on. Um, so I graduated last year from Cranbrook Academy of Art Sculpture Department. Uh, um, I am back this year, which I'm super excited and thankful for as the studio fellow in the sculpture department. Uh, so I'm back at Cranbrook again, working out of um, Detroit area and um, of course, at Cranbrook Academy of Art, which is super exciting and fun. Um, I'm uh, with this particular piece in the show. It's a part of a series of four works, uh, starting from uh, Casablanca in 1942, then Dirty Harry in 1971, First Blood, which is the first installation of the Rambo franchise in 1982, and Avengers Endgame in 2019. So it starts with sort of um, classic cinema, comes all the way through to contemporary cinema and tracks the progression of representation of heroes or quote heroes, quote iconic kind of film males in cinema. Um, and it's tracking specifically how their weapons increase in size and ability to deal damage as well as their bodies. and. It's also com dis discussing and commenting about um, how heroes in cinema have largely been represented by white men and um, how pointing to the problematic nature of that and the underrepresentation of people of color in cinema. Uh, so it's questioning these sorts of major kinds of um, threads throughout the history of cinema. I studied film in undergrad, so that's a huge part of my practice. and. Um, something I'm excited to continue to explore. I'm happy to be here. And I also loved that opening video. Uh, that was quite awesome, Jimmy. So thank you for, uh, for that sweet uh, bit of film and, and photograph there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of my quick intro. <laughs> okay, and now Tiffany Danielle Elliott. I also really enjoyed that video a lot. Thank you. Um, so I live and work out of Seattle right now and I'm doing art full time. And I also run an artist residency um, think tank kind of model that we're getting off the ground out here in Seattle. Um, the piece that I have in the Sculpture Center right now, actually, that they're showing on the screen is a still shot from it. It's called the Digital Companion. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and let everyone know that I'm actually running it right now with someone. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But so with the Digital Companion, people have options to sign up for digital companionship. Um, and then I, you know, spend whatever time and whatever meter method that they want with them. And then each week I update the video um, with just a small reflection about my experience of the digital companionship. And then also I update it with, I have bots that sign up. And so I, I update the glitches in the screen with each bot that signs up. So the person that I'm um, texting with, so they asked to for me to hang out with them for nine hours today over text message. And she's a new mom and she feels really isolated and alone and asked if I could just chat with her all day about what she's thinking about how life is going. So if you see me texting during this, I'm actually texting to her about what we're talking about and just kind of talking back and forth about our lives. Um, so I thought it was kind of perfect that they happened to line up when I was talking. Um, so yeah, this piece is a lot about, um, I'm really interested in mediation and I'm interested in, uh, technology and I think you know there's so many alarming things about how technology what it's doing to us relationally and personally um, I don't know if anyone has seen the social dilemma recently it's amazing everyone should check it out but it does you know there's all these things that are coming out as a documentary that makes you think like what is happening to our humanity our bodies our relationships um, but I like to think about like how we can actually use technology and kind of think of it in a third frame. And is there a way to subvert that and use technology to bring us closer to each other? I don't know, maybe not. But a lot of my work is about asking questions and kind of following through and seeing what can happen. 
so that's what this piece is a lot about i'm just kind of um running through it and then i'll continue to make in that last photo there were two videos and sometimes i do more than just reflections but i make full like video artifacts or poetry or poems or videos or even like sound pieces based on my experiences with people Sorry, you can go back to the next one. And then I just, um, there's some work on here about the other big project that I'm working on right now. I'm also really interested in memory and identity and particularly how fallible our um, memories can be and how they change constantly and how we construct our identities around our memories. And then we construct our group identities around that. And so what happens, what do we do with the fact that those memories can change? And so this picture that uh, they're kind of flowing through right now is a piece I did um, in 2019 called My Sister. And I'm currently expanding this into several projects with more, more people in my family and also people in my past that aren't just my sister. But in this piece, I spent all day writing out every memory I could think of without editing or filter about my sister and I. And this is the first piece I ever done on my family. Um, and then she came in at night and she edited it in green pen. And I realized like so many of our memories were so different. And yet those memories had formed who we thought we were based on how we remember that memory. So what does that mean? Um, and so a lot of that was the investigation into um that story and what identity means around that it was a really cool and intense piece and so now i'm expanding that uh through writing and sound installation and video with a lot of different people so that's my that's my spiel that's great i was looking at your work or all of your work earlier today and really enjoyed uh the investigations i found and i think this topic is is uh really interesting because We've all been on so many meetings with our friends where we say, you know, no more pandemic talk, but this is fun because it's pandemic talk about specifically art and what it means to be even exhibiting and uh, making during the pandemic. And I think that's uh, pretty important. Did that, when the, the pandemic happened, at, you know, putting on our artist hats now and maker hats and cultural producer hats, uh, how did that affect you? What were your initial reactions to it or i'm sure you knew you had the show coming up and uh what were your first pressing concerns etc um, i can just jump in this with this really initial thought and um, i mean i do a lot of performance art and so my initial question was like oh my gosh how do you do performance art when you can't touch anyone and when everyone's afraid of of everyone and we're afraid of our bodies and we're afraid of each other and so much of my work is about wanting to bring i and i'm also just such a, a touch person and such a physical person um and so that that was immediately something i started thinking about and so it did push me more into um the digital working more and more like just embracing this digital technological side of my work and then the other side is it just, I mean, I don't know if I'm the only artist that feels this way, but it just kind of throws you for a loop of like, what is the meaning of anything anymore? Does anything that I do matter? Should I redo my entire art practice? Should I stop doing what I've been doing for the last 10 years? Um, and so that has a profound impact on the way you create work when you're doubting the meaning of everything you're doing and the importance of it. Yeah, I definitely ha agree with all that you said there, Elle. Um, I think for me, just where, with where I was at when it first hit was, I was pushing really into my thesis piece. Um, and I was really deep in my investigations there. And so when everything was canceled, it was really devastating. Um, and I think for a while, it just took me a, a definitely a, a lot of time to even get back into the kind of sort of making kind of mentality because I was so um, going at it really strongly. And then it was just a complete, just total standstill, halt, stop. So I think that I, I kind of shifted a little bit into some of the other ways that I make. And I tend to kind of talk about my, my making or creative output as it sort of evolves and I feel unfolds in seasons. And I, I like the, to use the term seasons talking about it. So I, I love my visual art practice. I love film and I love music. And I, when the sort of when the pandemic hit and the kind of visual arts piece in terms of the work that I was doing at Cranbrook sculpturally 
kind of shut down. Um, I, I transitioned kind of heavily into some of the other ways of making that I do, especially music and, and playing music. Um, cause that was something that gave me a lot of internal feedback and comfort and enjoyment. Um, and so there were certain things in music that I was kind of trying to get at um, or different techniques that I was trying to learn. Uh, and I kind of dove deeply into that because I just needed some space, I think, between um, what I was doing with my visual arts practice because it was such a huge kind of uh, uh, just stopping point out of nowhere. And, um, you know, I... I think for me, I've definitely been questioning as I'll discuss kind of like, what am I doing and whatnot? Um, and uh, I think that I needed a bit of space to engage with a kind of different type of creative output because it allowed me to sort of stay in it creatively, but be working in a different way. So that was super important for me when it hit was that I was able to kind of lean on some of my my other big time creative interests, you know, that's kind of where I went immediately. Um, yeah. Um, I can definitely relate to everything that everyone said. Um, for me, one of my main goals of going to graduate school was to be able to use the resources and facilities. And I haven't really been able to do that except like one semester of my very first semester at Cranbrook. Um, and back in April, I was supposed to do a performance in Detroit and then Cranbrook got closed down and I had to move back to LA and um, that project has been put on hold ever since. Um, I think one thing that um, I actually find valuable is that um, the current situation has force me to let go of control and be more open to um, play spontaneity and chance in my practice. Um, I mean, at the beginning, it was very hard to even focus or do anything. Um, but like right now, I'm exploring and experimenting with materials that um, I haven't worked with in the past. And um, in addition to that, I've been thinking a lot about ambiguous loss um, in relation to my loved ones in Iran, more specifically my grandparents. Um, they're getting older and um, not knowing when I will be able to go back to Iran to see them feels like an indefinite loss. And um, at times, I mean, not, I mean, there were a lot of moments that I was just asking myself whether I want to do what I'm doing right now. I should just go back to Iran and be with my loved ones, considering what's going on right now. Um, but also, I've been looking for ways to deal with these feelings of loss and grief through making work. We can't hear you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, when I look at all your work, I, I, there's so much physicality to each of them. I really resonated. I, I like to make physical things myself and experience those things. And they're all physical in different ways, uh, but related ways. I can really see why Sarah uh, selected uh, the three of you to be together. Um, and I, and I, it just seems like I got to say when you, you were all saying, well, what does this mean? The disappointment, what does this matter? Uh, at first, you're, you, you feel like guilty. Well, if people are dying, why am I disappointed? Because I can't have my art show, right? And then uh, it's, you know, art was like second fiddle before the pandemic. And then it's like, what's happening? And then, well, if all the museum people are getting laid off, should I be mad that we're not having shows, right? So what, where does all that come in? And I think it's really hard. Uh, to do and uh, what when you're in your stu studio, have you adapted since the beginning? I know you touched on that a little bit. Are you making work? Is it worth making? Do you is it all digital work? Uh, you mentioned music and trying to connect with people. Like how do you how do you make it so it's a real thing? Because I, I find the same thing. Like what what who cares? But why 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 make work? Why have this exhibition? Why be here now? Um, 
Yeah, I think, okay, I don't really know what it, I don't really know what it means to be an artist or really know the answers to anything. This is what I'm realizing <laughs> is like the older I get, the more I'm like, everything I thought I knew is not true or is like such a small part of it. I'm not getting it. And so that's my preface. I don't really know what it means to be an artist, period, much less during this period of time. But um, the reason that I am an artist is because I'm just, I'm upset. I'm so highly curious and I'm obsessed with asking questions. And I often tell people the only reason I'm an artist is it's the only profession that will let me do that. I like, I'll get kicked out of any other job if I just continuously push buttons and ask questions. So for me, I've continued to do that. And this has opened up different ways for me to do it. Like for instance, one of the very first things I did, I was supposed to be in a physical show um, in Seattle and it got closed and moved online. And I thought, oh gosh, we have to change this. So I'm doing this collaboration um, with another artist and it's called User. And we started out with our first piece. Um, it's with Cecilia Roscada. And I was just really fascinated. I'm always fascinated by access and physical access and physical space, especially in Seattle where, um, real estate is a premium and you can really see um, who's in and who's out and all these things. So then what it was, I, we switched and we started this thing called user and I have a pro zoom account. And I started thinking like immediately, like, Whoa, if, if you have the pro account, if you have the nice real estate, even in the internet, in this place, that's not really a place. We don't even know where we are. Um, then you can be on there for as long as you want and have all these features. And you really began to see that. So what I, we did was we took part of it was we took the, um, for a month, our Zoom room, and we made it an open, an open source room. And so for an entire month, we left it open and you could have 500 people in there and different groups would come in and meet and like just having to navigate safety and security on their own and not having it regulated, but also not being kicked out. And people were coming in there and having meetings together. And like, there was like a random girl, little middle school girls that would come in and hang out because they didn't have a Zoom room. So things like that. I just feel like I'm just still asking questions. And as the world is changing, I'm just asking the questions about how we're changing with it. Yeah, I um, have, I, I think I've had a bit of trouble sort of jumping back into where I was at previously with my work. Um, I, it was interesting, you know, I was way down the line with my thesis piece and then the pandemic hit and things changed and a lot of what we've discussed, you know, um, what, what is important, what doesn't feel important anymore, you know, kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> and then sort of when I re-engaged with that work, I was kind of like, I don't know if I, you know, am wanting to kind of continue along with this, or maybe I'll just kind of set it down for a second and then um, maybe return to it, you know, months from now, a year, year from now, whatever. But one thing that I have felt recently is shifting into, um, you know, a lot of the work that I was doing before was uh, really based in, in research and different sorts of uh, um, books that I was reading, you know, films that I was watching, pulling from different ki kinds, of, kinds of like theory and discourse and whatnot. And I think that I've really recently been interested in diving into more personal works um that uh are using material that's really personal for me like from my house um building works kind of from that because i just feel like i'm uh i just think i don't it's hard to even articulate at this point because i think it's so new but i'm just interested in these new things because of all the shifting I feel that's been going on. And then I, I find that I'm not quite as maybe engaged with what I was with before. And this kind of idea of switching to these kind of personal things or engaging with these really kind of personal materials in my work is, has been really um, something that's been kind of scratching the back of my, my head, I guess. So that's been kind of a shift in my practice. And I would say that right now I'm, I'm starting to get back into it, but um, it's also been really, really nice to come back as the studio fellow here at Cranbrook and be doing kind of administrative things for the department, working in different ways in terms of talking with students about work, meeting with students about works, kind of dealing with the department sort of administrative stuff. So I feel like my foot's still in, 
my, my field in the art world, but I'm engaging with it in a different way than I kind of was before. And that's been really, really good for me and nice for me, I think. Um, and I, I think I'm right at that point of kind of diving deeply back into my sculptural practice, but I just think I needed some, some time. That's kind of the best thing I think I can say, you know, Um, for me, I'm thinking about nine years ago when I just had moved to the United States. And back then, it was through the process of art making that I was able to cope with a lot of things that I was going through at the time, um, especially through art performance. And um, right now, I think the only way that I can actually cope with a lot of things that we're all going through it's like a collective trauma is through making art and i'm exploring materials or um thinking about concepts that i had them on hold for some time especially when i was at cranbrook i had like mini projects that i would go back at that like at times but right now also considering the space that i am in because i have um spatial limitations so there are things that I can't really do right now. So I'm um, exploring and experimenting with new ideas and materials. Um, and also I've been thinking a lot about performance and ways in which I can work with the space that I have now or do collaborations through Zoom, which is a it's not something that we're used to, so we'll see where that goes. Yeah, I, yeah, it's not something we're used to. We're on these platforms all the time, right? So uh, we get used to them and uh, then not used to them and get tired out pretty hard. Um, and as in a, in a, as our um, next kind of focus, I think uh, for me, when we started the pandemic, I was really like, what the hell, you know, why does this matter? Who cares? And I think as artists, we go through those periods all the time. It's very, every artist's path is different. Every human's path is different about what's up, what's down. And, and you have, sometimes everything's great and sometimes everything's down. And my experience is I'm really excited when I'm in a studio making things. And then when everything's done, it's pretty kind of, oh, okay. You know, it's, it's like to everyone else, to the rest of the people, everything's super exciting, right? After you, you've done all this work and you've presented it, but you've just lived with this for, you know, a year or whatever it is, and then you give it to people and then it's kind of a letdown. And this is like the ultimate letdown because everything's canceled. Like you can't work on your thesis, you can't use the facilities, you can't go touch people. Uh, you know, there's, it's just really hard. And I think we always second guess ourselves as artists, like, why don't you go do a real thing? Um, and I'm wondering how your, we must all, we all have dreams. Like we all want to be in the Whitney Biennial. We all want to, you know, be Bruce Nauman that's having a show at the MoMA during the pandemic. Like, it's like, sometimes it sucks to be uh, showing during the pandemic, but you're still Bruce Nauman, right? So that's cool. Uh, so how, how, how do you balance that out? Uh, what your previous goals and career and what you really dreamed of, what you think you're going to do, I mean, what do you want to do when you're out of school and uh, ma making art as an artist? What do you, what, and how has that changed based on recent events and reevaluations in your mind? I know I've been going first, but I need a second on this one. If, if either one of you want to answer that first. <laughs> Yeah, I think I can, I can kind of jump in. Um, you know, for me, one big, huge interest of mine has always been teaching. I love teaching and that's something that I'm really pushing towards. Um, and so one, I'm really excited to be back at Cranbrook as the studio fellow and teaching and engaging in those ways. Um, but I'll, I'll say too that I think since the pandemic, you know, Ella and I have talked a lot about this. I'm, I'm a, also a really in-person person. I love being face-to-face. -face. Um, it's been really hard. And something that I felt 
really heavily recently is is for me um that i i am i i I love my work and 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 making art is survival for me it's something that's super important to who i am as a person but i found that i feel that like half of my art Art, art practice and what I do would be missing if I don't am not engaging in community and I'm not engaging in teaching or, or or kind of you know like so many people have invested in me and I just feel like I and even more so since the pandemic it's like I want to also be doing that for others and so it's interesting because since there's been such a lack of kind of physical community I've felt that more than ever, maybe that is vital to my practice and vital to what I need as a human, as an artist, as a person. Um, And so I kind of look at it as sort of my art practice and sort of the personal things that I'm, that I'm critiquing, addressing, questioning, but then part of that practice too is engaging with community, whether it's teaching, whether it's, um, helping people with their practice, whatever that is. So community has become really important for me during this. And I think, um, it always was, but I've really articulated and found that going forward, that has to be something that's a part of how I engage. Um, some things that have really shifted for me that have been super tough um, I mentioned earlier how, how much of a huge part music is a part of my life. And part part of music, what I love so much about it is performing. And a huge part of that performance is with an audience. And, you know, one of the first things that I thought of when I when graduating Cranbrook was, I'm going to get right back in a band. That was like number one on my list. And so that's something that's majorly shifted. Um, you know, I don't know when. I'm going to kind of be able to do that or sort of perform in those ways again. And so sort of taking that in and sitting with that and then trying to move through that and make performance and music work again is I think um, something that's shifted for me. You know, that was something that I, I didn't, um, I never thought would, would kind of be out of my life, but now it is because you just can't do it. You just can't perform in rooms with, with, with lots of people or audience. And so that's something that's definitely shifted and kind of changed in terms of um, sort of my outlook on my practice and, and career. And I, I also don't, I don't really think of, there's these sort of three major things, film, music, and my visual arts and sculptural practice. And when I'm talking about these things, I don't see them as distinct. I kind of see them as all a part of this larger creative output. And so I kind of like to seamlessly go from one to the other um, and then incorporate them and intersect them. So with the music piece, it's like I, that is part of my practice. That's part of my kind of day to day. And so that is something that's totally shifted for me. So I'd say that, and then also this kind of um, real, real, um, own self-discovery of how important community for me is to engage with. Um, in general, and then within my arts practice and within the arts community. Um, For me, in addition to continuing my practice, um, my plan is to further my involvement in art education and community activism. That said, um, after graduation, um, at least for a year, I would like to travel and um, while continuing my art practice. And I think the most efficient way for me to do that is to do it through artist residencies. In that way, you would have a community to um, share your work with and have dialogues with, have a space to work. Also, you can take advantage of the city or the country you're at and you can explore it. Um, Also, I would like to, I mean, it's one of my plans to um, go back to my motherland and um, visit my family, um, do some research and make work for some time. But um, of course we are in a precarious time and there is an open-ended uncertainty and 
things are probably gonna be like this for at least a year. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I do want to be an artist and I am an artist and that's what I, and I do enjoy showing my work and having people see it, but I, I feel like I have this other really big interest in the artists and that's the way artists think and their creativity. So this um, residency, which is called the Seattle Residency Project that um, I helped co-found co um, and that I'm working on is more, I'm, I'm interested in what happens when you bring creative thought with policy. And so um, what happens when an artist can't make work um, that doesn't change how brilliant their minds are. And I'm gonna get, if you'll allow me to be really nerdy for just a second, I've been really interested in sleep lately um, and particularly how it affects a memory. And so um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with some of the stuff, but I'm just like reveling in a lot of it. But this idea that like when we go to sleep, um, and we go into rapid eye movement that we're actually like integrating our memories and we're sloughing off memories from the day that we don't need. And then we're like integrating the ones that we do um, that kind of forms our identity. And it's a little bit, it's compared a little bit to like how a computer defragments. But what's also interesting about the brain is that our brain is designed and like in the way that it's like evolved is to create these like connections constantly. So what happens when our brain's defragmenting, it's making connections of all the pieces that are left over. So it's why you might like be dreaming that, uh, you're like flying to the moon and you're pregnant with your cat. And then it turns into the fact that you're pregnant with your mom and then your dad eats you and that all feels normal, right? <laughs> like we all have those dreams. And so there's these studies that have come out that I've been re like reading and researching that are fascinating about how people that are highly creative and a lot of times artists and with high imaginations um, have similar waking thoughts the ways they think as when they're sleeping in this REM cycle. And so the reason why being an artist is so important and why we need artists so much is because that's how things are designed because artists are putting together two things that shouldn't go together. Like what happens if you join a cat and a hairbrush? What does that mean? And we come up with all these bad ideas and then we invent something or create something that no one else thought was possible. Um, so for me, that is like the driving force behind why I'm an artist and why I like working with artists and why I want to do this, um, continue to work on this artist residency. So for me, I'm simultaneously pursuing my own art practice and career and asking questions and creating and making, um, but also pushing into like, how do we like, just like, how can I as an artist also support other artists to speak? So I'm working on a couple projects right now. One's called Interloper, where we're trying to open um, exhibition spaces in places that they wouldn't normally be. Like we're building a billboard on a really busy highway that's text-based, and we're going to pay artists to just say one sentence. What's the one thing you're not allowed to say in a place you're not allowed to say it? We're going to pay you to say it on this billboard. And then we have another space that's like a full gallery that's been built out, and we, I wanted to open it. And then COVID happened, so we're actually opening it as a non-space space. So actually it'll be a physical space where artists will install their work, but you can only see it in a non-space way. So they get to decide. It could be like through live streaming or Zoom, or maybe you allow one person for the whole show and they write about it. And that's the only thing people can read. So for me, it's just a lot of, we might have our spaces taken away or our normal ways of working, but we haven't had our creativity taken away. And we're just... I'm just like, all right, what pieces can we put together that make no sense and seem like a dream and are kind of crazy, but maybe we could reinvent art. Yeah, those are all really good thoughts and responses. I, I feel the same way um, in, in our preparatory documents that I was trying to think back. When I, if I was thinking about myself from when I was in, uh, in school and finishing graduate school and looking at myself now, in some ways I'd be super happy, like I've done well and done a lot of things. Um, and in other ways I'd be mad because I always wanted to thumb my nose at authority. And, and in some ways I'm kind of uh, am, am doing things that, you know, like I have students that are my students, right? So that's weird. So like, I shouldn't be doing that. My, my 20 year old self would say, don't do that, Jimmy. Uh, but, but my, my now self is saying, hey, well, maybe you could think about this thing. So it's kind of interesting how careers evolve and do different things. Um, and I'm so lucky right now because I got to ask three artists uh, three questions. And usually when I go to an art opening, it takes me forever, even though I'm a kind of boisterous person to go up and ask the artist a question because everybody's talking to them and do, do they really care about what I want to think? Aren't they just tired from installing? And so that luxury was amazing. So I would love to open it up to everyone else to ask uh, these artists questions because you don't even have to be nervous because there's nobody here you can just 
hang up if, if something goes wrong. So please, please ask some questions. This is the, the most fun thing is to pick artist brains. Hi, yes, um, so I have a question. Um, first off, thank you so much for being here. This is really cool. I feel like I'm always in museums and I want to talk to the artists about why'd you do this? And you just really can't talk to through them through the space and time. Um, but my question for you guys is just because this is something I always wonder. You have this eclectic mesh of passions and interests that have helped you pursue your art. And this may be getting a little historical on you, but like what's do you have like a moment in your life that you realize like this is how I need to go about pursuing my passions is through art? Or did you ever feel like maybe I could try writing? Maybe I just want to do teaching or maybe I just want to be in a rock band. Like, I guess what was the crystallizing moment for you? Like the only way for me to appropriately pursue my passion is to do this. I know, I just, I just dropped one on you, so take you can take a minute. No, I was just saying, I'm not sure that I've made that decision yet, because I think that there's so many different, I mean, like, I made that decision in the fact that, like, I feel like, actually, when I went to Cranbrook, for me, that was a decision of, like, this is what I'm going to do professionally, this is what I'm going to pursue. Um, but I also think there's so many different ways to ask questions and, and to work through these thoughts and ideas um, that I'm open to it. Like, I, you know, I'm actually working on a writing project right now, and um, and I would love to teach and I love talking. But also I was thinking, I, I remember a very distinct moment and this is really, and actually Luke's gonna laugh, but I was like really young and I was watching um, Great Expectations with Ethan Hawke and Francesco Clemente did all the artwork for that movie and it was way ahead of its time and it's still my favorite movie. But I remember sitting in the movie theater alone as like a teenager watching this movie and thinking, art can do this, I could do that. And so for me, it's not, wasn't, it was never like a moment of like deciding that art was the only way. It was this moment of like, art is a way to do something that I can't do through anything else. And when all else fails, I can do it through this. And I still feel that way every single time I go to a show and see something amazing or see an amazing movie or anything. I get so excited I can't contain it because I'm like, I had no idea we could do this and we can do it through imagination. Uh, for me, um, when I was in Iran at the time, I wanted to do set design when I was around 18, 19 years old. And um, in Iran, in order to be able to go to a university, you have to do, take an entrance exam. And so I, my major was mathematics and, um, but I was always in, was involved in creative fields like drawing, painting, I would take pottery classes. And um, my mom wouldn't let me to actually go to art school, um, but, when I, was an eight, when I was 18 and I was ready to study for entrance exam, one of my aunts pushed my mom to let me to go to an arts institution and study for art. And that was a moment that was actually very um, life-changing and I always um, appreciate my aunt and I can never forget the efforts she has put in. So back then I studied for set design and I wanted to go to university. I got into an art school in Iran, but my parents decided to move to the U.S. And at the time I still was dependent on them. So I didn't have any choice. I had to move here and I wasn't really happy about it. And I moved here. I still wanted to do set design and I went to a community college. I realized that um, they didn't have a major specifically for set design for theater and play. So I um, took classes in the art department and I think it was then that I also met someone who became my mentor. So it was back then that I realized I wanted to be an artist. But even now, um, I'm still struggling because one thing that I was very passionate about was dance and body-based practices. And um, I mean, I could still bring it into my practice. That's what I've been doing in the past. But I think even though you can do both at the same time, 
in order to master one field, you need to focus on one specific area. And even though I don't want that to be true, but I, you know, I experience it. I talk to people, and so I still don't know. I mean, I want to be an artist. I'm an artist, but um, when I see a dance piece, it like it moves every cell of my body. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I think uh, it was kind of always present, even from being really young. Um, and when I've talked about this before, I tend to use this language of, um, I had a number of interests and was exposed to a lot, but, and I don't even know if I would call it art making at the time when I was little, like I just thought of it as making, but that's what drove me as a person. So like, that's kind of where it started to sort of lay the, the roots, I guess you could say, because I found that unlike anything else that I would engage with, um, making was the thing that drove me. It was the thing that I was super excited about. So the, the sort of older I got and the further along I got and I had amazing mentors and I'm so, so grateful for them. Um, but the, the sort of further along I went, I think it started to shift from this idea of creative making to then working on art or being an artist, you know, is kind of where it, a sort of shift started to happen, but always from very young, that's what drove me. I was I, I would engage with things like sports or other types of things, but that the the feedback that I got internally from that was never like not even on the same level uh, as what I would get from creative endeavor and endeavors. And so that was kind of, it sort of always was there and then began continued to get more pronounced as I got older, but there was a moment that I remember super specifically. And it was, um, it was like, at the onset of my senior year of undergrad and I was dealing with, there was some health stuff that was going on. And so I tried with that I was going through and I sort of tried to juggle my schedule. And one thing that I thought was, okay, well maybe this particular semester I'll take um, a break from studio art because I would spend so much time there that I was like, maybe I need a little bit of time and I'll kind of take a break. And um, I, so I signed up for a course load for one semester without a studio art class. And it was like two days in and I was like, I can't do this. Um, and so then I went um, to one professor and I was like, Hey, I, I, I've got to, I've got to drop this course because of a scheduling. And then I went to my ceramics professor um, who at that point I had done the, the, the sort of credits to lead up to an, an independent study. And I was like, hey, can I do an independent study with you? I know it's a little bit late to the um, the game in terms of uh, registration. And he's like, oh yeah, absolutely. And so then I got into a, a ceramics course with him and I was like, okay, never will I ever again live my life without art because it's so a part of my survival. And I, I used that language earlier and that's not hyperbole. I mean, it's really so such a part of my being that um, I'm happier with it. I feel healthier with it. It's such a pillar of my life that I think that was the moment I was going, okay, you know, I have these multiple avenues within cre the creative field that I'm interested in, film, music, visual arts. But I was like, that's, that's it for me. Like, I don't know what will be the avenue A. Like, will it be music? Will it be sculpture? Will it be film? You know, um, but I'm like, I have to be working in a creative field. And I think, like I said, it was kind of always there, but really solidified in that moment, um, my senior year. Yeah. I'm just going to add on something to this too. I was thinking about um, that, like these, I think sometimes I forget to talk about this uh, and also we forget about, but that moment is also a hard one moment um, in particular. I think about this a lot with art, that there's such a class um, question. So for me, I grew up in pretty, uh, pretty, uh, 
low poverty and also where education and I grew up in conservative South. And so in very religious environment. And so not only was education and art were seen as these like lo lofty liberal ideas. And so for me to decide to go in this direction was actually a betrayal of my family and my community. You know, I often say like the main thing my father's then the most disappointed in me in life is that I have two masters and he's so disappointed in me about it. Um, and so culturally, like there was so, I was never even introduced to art or never allowed to be around art. And so it was, I'm very aware of that as an artist that what it costs so many artists to make that choice. I mean, it's an insane choice, right? Like it's unreasonable. Um, and it's like to do something that like you don't necessarily have financial guarantee most of the time or know that you can do anything with it. So I'm just, always, I think it's a really great question that you asked and it's, it's a really hard question to answer. And sometimes we don't realize what it costs people to make that choice. Thank you so much for your openness. These are just things I never get to talk to anyone about or really think of. So, and like you guys, I love talking with people and communicating. So thank you again for doing this and answering such a complicated question. I'm gonna jump in um, with a question. Um, one of the things at the Sculpture Center that we are um, focusing on is this concept of mentorship, and you've all kind of talked about it briefly. Um, but I guess, and at Cranbrook, that's, you know, one of the systems that's built into your um, process of being there. And um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this, like, where uh, or how do you find to develop a mentor and this process, um, is it necessarily from the art world? And also like, what happens when you're like, not done, but like, you know, you graduate and then you lose your relationship like with Rebecca Ripple. Um, what happens when that's gone? Anybody? <laughs> Yeah, I can, I've got some thoughts. Um, you know, mentorship is huge for me. That's, um, you know, I love taking people on tours and uh, I love taking them on tours of Cranbrook. That's something that I've done a lot of and I really enjoy it. And one thing I say is mentorship, cross collaboration between departments and self-directed studio practice are like three huge kind of pillars of, of the school. And so that was one thing that really drew me to Cranbrook. Um, but I was, I've been really blessed with a number of amazing mentors in my life. And um, from early on in, in, in high school, and then I had amazing mentors in college and an amazing mentor with Rebecca here in graduate school. Um, and I think a huge sort of part of the cultivation process for me and in, in my experience is um, one, the relationship progresses and, you know, in my undergrad, it was sort of like professor, then mentor. And now I'm really gr great, like great friends with, with, you know, these mentors that I had. And um, I think that it's, it's, it's a mutual real sort of buy-in from both sides. Um, whereas like I love mentoring and I think a lot of folks love mentoring. And then I think the student also has to be like um, very open to uh, pushing or, or, or working into becoming that person that when there's some sort of job task op opportunity, um, like they go to, and, or whoever the mentor or professor is, is like, okay, I know someone that I can, that I can sort of, you know, tap into for this. And so I worked really, really hard in undergrad to sort of put myself into um, a place where if something came up with my, my mentors, like if they had a, an installation of a personal work, if they needed to clean the clay mixer, if they needed to like dig fence posts out of their backyard, like I just said yes to everything. And I was like, I'll do any of that because I really wanted that, that mentorship and guidance. And so I think it was like 
I invested and then they invested in me. And it's this like back and forth sort of mutual, really beautiful thing. Um, and I'm so blessed and so lucky to have had that. And the other thing for me with your last question about like what happens when you, you sort of move on or, or like the, you graduate. Um, I have moved, like I've been out of undergrad for three years now and, um, I still get like my professor's Christmas cards and I still am in talks with them all the time. And so for me, uh, I've, I've maintained that and, and continued to cultivate it throughout. And although sort of, um, the relationship has shifted from like student professor, it's more of this kind of artist, artist, friend, friend. And so when they have opportunities come up in terms of, something like firing a, a Tuchigama style kiln, um, which my ceramics professor invited me back to fire, you know, it was a year after I had graduated. And so, you know, we'd maintained contact and then I was able to go back and, and work with him on that. And it was like a thrill of my life, you know? And so I think that for me, those relationships have continued even after graduation, but they've like shifted and, and changed into kind of new other beautiful sorts of relationships. Um, which has been, it's just such a amazing part of life. So I feel so lucky for the mentors that I've had and so grateful. I was just going to answer. Um, I did not lose Rebecca Ripple. I don't know if she would answer that, but I'm saying I have not lost her. Um, but, but seriously though, in like a, in a, a real way, I think Rebecca was an amazing, uh, just an amazing mentor. And I think really I could call her up and ask and talk to her and she's so available. I'm always saying I'm waiting for her to realize she shouldn't be so available to us, but we're benefiting from it right now. Um, but then also on another way, like I, another way I haven't lost Rebecca because I actually moved into her department from, from photography um, because I'd been spending time over there doing an elective and I was just blown away with how she thought and more specifically how she challenged me. Um, and a lot of my mentors before had found my strengths and pushed me to do more of my strong suit. And Rebecca found my weaknesses and pushed her finger to, into them and made me think more about that. And that stuck with me. And I think a lot of times her voice uh, is still in my head when I'm making work or I'm thinking about things like, what would Rebecca think about this? Or what would she say? Or where would she tell me I should do it more? I didn't do what I was saying. Um, and that was a gift. And I think that to me is good mentorship is it is where that mentorship continues on throughout life, even if they're not in, in your, uh, in your life. And the second thing I was going to say is actually I was listening ironically to a podcast this morning about mentorship. And it was talking to these people who had like, um, different people who had like done a lot in their professions and asking like how they had, there was a commonality. They had all had these amazing mentors that had opened doors for them and taught them things. And, and the point of the podcast was like, well, how are you now mentoring? And really I thought about that. Like there's such a problem with access to mentors. And I immediately was like, yeah, what artists are actually opening up their studio and their life to mentor? Like we think of you know, mentorship shouldn't just be education and, and just be accessible within graduate school. And then I started thinking, whoa, am I mentoring anyone? And I think that that to me is more of the question of like, who are we all mentoring? Because if we did that, then we could also get mentors. Um, and I just, I was, I was thinking a lot about this morning of like, gosh, why isn't there more accessibility to artists that are further along than us that would be willing to mentor us? Um, well, Rebecca um, has made herself always available, and I believe she'll be there whenever we need to talk to her. And um, I'm thankful for that. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. I mean, I've been trying to stay in touch with my previous mentor throughout the years, and um, there is this one specific person that I met eight years ago when I was in community college who was very um, influential in terms of my practice or just my um, life. Um, and I've been in touch with her ever since. And I think these are very valuable things that I'm grateful for. Can I ask you, Malika, um, do you find it, um, you know, 
um, since you came here only eight years ago and you know your culture is different from most people here, have you found it um, uh, more challenging um, to relate to people or find more or find people to relate to you? Has it, um, I don't know, what is your take on that? Um, <clears throat> it hasn't been that challenging, but I would say it's been disappointing at times. But um, also, I mean, for me, it took some time to find my people. Um, and I try to um, stay in touch with them and um, have them in my life because it took a few years for me to find the people that I can actually um, connect to and have dialogues with. But um, throughout the years and um, being in undergrad and nine graduate school, it's, I mean, um, it's more, it's been more disappointing than challenging, but also I'm grateful for the people that I have in my life that have been always there for me. Well, I just have to say on, on mentors, uh, I have, it's weird how you get them. They're just natural. And my main mentor has become a lifelong friend and, uh, you can never predict that until after it happens. It's like hindsight is twenty twenty. It's like so obvious looking back, like, oh yeah, that's why all those things happen. So I think you should just be open to experiences and um, ready to do things. I really identified with a lot of uh, what you all said. And Jimmy, how is it, you know, you're now in this position where you're teaching and working with, um, you know, uh, excellent art students who come to, you know, CIA to study. And um, I guess, um, how do you find, you know, you know, just nature of student teacher relationship, but then developing that into more of a mentorship relationship? How, how does that happen? I, I guess is what I'm trying to get, get at. Well, I'm going to repeat myself because teachers repeat themselves all the time. It's kind of what teachers do. But uh, uh, what I always tell my students is there's this law in the universe. And to say hello to someone the second time, no matter what you do, you got to say hello the first time. It's just, it's just kind of how it works out. And so uh, I've never been able to overcome this. And so I teach the students to talk to me, talk to artists. And I would love this. I, I can recognize some names. I know there are students here now. Uh, and they should ask artists questions right now. And then um, that's how you have to do it. You have to just try to um, be relatable, but at the same time, there's a, there's a, there's a, a dynamic there. There's, a, there's an authoritative and uh, um, uh, pupil dynamic that you have to deal with as well. And so it's a balance and I just try to do your best and uh, then hopefully say hello the third time. Do we have any more questions? Anybody want to step in? Um, if not, uh, we'll probably wrap up. I do have one more <laughs> very important question that um, has been um, on my mind and you don't have to answer. What are you going to do for Halloween? <laughs> Are you going to dress up if you observe? I decided to do the scariest possible thing that I could do. And on Halloween, which I'm still not as a good idea, I'm taking my 13 year old daughter and we're getting on an airplane for the first time. And so that's what I'm doing on Halloween is I'm going to be flying and we're going to, we decided to dress up and that's what we wanted to do to scare ourselves. We're actually, and actually even scarier, I can tell you this is even scarier. We've been going back and forth on visiting um, a close family member in North Carolina, um, which COVID rates are so high. Um, and it's actually going to be like right over the election. And so I'm doing the most insane thing possible, getting on a plane and I'm going to hang out in North Carolina for a week with my daughter. 
<laughs> I love it. Uh, I don't know about, so, uh, I'm not sure about dressing up yet. We'll see. But, um, I carve a pumpkin every year without like, no doubt. I always carve a pumpkin. That is like tradition since I was able to do it. And I was just talking to friends. I was like, I always carve a pumpkin and, um, that is something that I will do this year. It's something I'll do next year. It's something I'll do every year as long as I can. And so I'm not sure about, about um, dressing up just with everything that's going on and whatnot, but I know that I'll be carving on pumpkin. And I'm also really, really big into a uh, monster movie cinema. Uh, I think it's quite interesting. If I shift this way, you can see an outtake of, wait, I'm reversed. Uh, Jaws, 1975, Steven Spielberg, uh, <laughs> laying in the mouth of Bruce, one of the three sharks they used for that movie. Um, I love that film. I love um, monster cinema in general. So I'm, I can tell you I'll be watching some, some monster movies and carving a pumpkin. Not sure if I'll dress up. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for coming. It was really great. And I got some animations and tunes to, to, to play everybody out on. I Just give a round of applause for all our great artists. Go see the show. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you.